I am happily married to Paul Watson. He's a Southwest Airlines pilot. And we have five amazing kids, ages 22 to 12-year-old twins. Uh, I actually have a daughter that is a junior, so some of you, I guess, are juniors. Uh, that is probably contemplating some of the things that you're contemplating. So I get to have lots of discussions like this with her, that she's trying to decide what she's going to do with her life, because as we tell her, you get one more year on the dole, and then you're cut off. So um, I grew up a military brat. My dad was in the Army. Uh, I spent uh, my whole life moving every two to three years. And uh, when it was time for me to go to college, I knew I wanted to go to college. Uh, and I knew I wanted to be just like my dad. I wanted to be a career military person, serve my country. And so the logical thing for me was um, to look at ROTC scholarships. Because my parents, who were Ohio residents, they basically told me, you're either going to an Ohio State school or you have to have a scholarship. And so I had never lived in Ohio at that point. Um, I guess my state school was Ohio State. Um, but when I looked at Ohio State, it was a little bit big for me. And so as we looked around different schools, uh, I actually fell in love with uh, St. Mary's College at Notre Dame. And Notre Dame had an ROTC program. Turns out I actually got a scholarship both to the Army and to the Air Force. And I joke that I chose the Air Force scholarship because I looked better in blue than I did in green. Um, but the truth of the matter was, you know, having a dad that had been in the Army, um, he actually steered me more towards the Air Force uh, because he said the Air Force teaches you a, a, a skill uh, and they do a great job of taking care of their people. And so I went into uh, the Air Force ROTC program in Notre Dame, and I would uh, be lying if I tell you that I was a great student. I wasn't. Uh, my scholarship was actually in mathematics. And uh, my, sophomore, my sophomore year, I actually went on academic probation. Uh, I wasn't prioritizing things properly. I was having a little bit too much fun. And, um, you know, I decided that I didn't really want to be a math major. I was only a math major because that's what my scholarship was in. So I called my dad and I said, Dad, um, I want to change my major. I want to be a business major. And he said, well, that's great. That is great. But you're going to go to Ohio State. You can't stay in St. Mary's because we can't afford it if you're not on a scholarship. And Air Force scholarships, they give them to you in a certain uh, functional area or degree. And so I decided, well, I really like St. Mary's. I liked my friends in my school. So I chose to stay at. And uh, while I will tell you I was not the best, best math student, I did graduate. Uh, and I stuck with math. I actually got a minor in computer science. And it's probably one of the best decisions that I ever made. Um, no idea I would end up in technology, but um, I'm very thankful that my dad you know, kind of gave me that ultimatum, and I actually made the decision to stay. Um, so I entered the military. My first assignment, uh, I actually went to Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi. Um, and yeah, it was. Well, it was fun because it was a bunch of second lieutenants. We only worked half a day. We we're all right out of college. Uh, and I studied communications and computers. And we had classes on things like how to stick a floppy disk in the computer. Um, things have changed a lot. But um, I ended up going from there to Los Angeles Air Force Base, which was Space Systems Division. And what I did in the military was I managed vendors that were building a weapon subsystem. So I would manage, my first assignment was in, uh, we're building a satellite control facility. Uh, so I was managing these big vendors, General Dynamics, uh, 
companies, GE, that were actually building electronic systems that we use in the military to control our military satellites that they um, go around the Earth. But I did that for a couple years, and then I moved to Wright-Patterson uh, from Los Angeles Air Force Base. I went to Dayton, Ohio. Uh, which is where I worked at, it was called Aeronautical Systems Center. So I went from satellite control facility acquisition and project management to aircraft. I worked on the C-17 airplane. I don't know if anybody knows what that is. It's kind of a big cargo plane, has wing tips that stick up, um, has jet engines, and it was the, it is the newest Air Force uh, cargo plane. Uh, I was able to manage the project to build the defensive systems, which are the flares that shoot out when when the plane gets shot at. It tries to deflect uh, any missiles that are coming towards. It was really cool. I got to manage 20-something vendors that were delivering several projects uh, that were subsystems on the airplane. And, and then I took a staff job. I worked for the four-star general that was running Air Force Material Command, which is a brand new command that had responsibility for cradle to grave, so acquisition through logistics. So building the weapon systems and then uh, supporting them until they were actually retired. And in that role, I got to see what it was like to be a CEO. Uh, I got to learn a lot of really valuable lessons, one of which was never assume anything. Always make sure that for important things you're checking and that things get completed on time. Uh, but I got to spend time with some very senior leaders and watch how they led people and how they led an organization. Uh, one of those individuals, his name is General Ron Yates. And he made a lasting impression in my life in that, you know, one day we were talking, this was after he had retired, and he said, um, I just got offered a job in Washington, D.C., and it paid a million dollars a year. And I looked at him and I said, oh my gosh, you're going to take that, right? And he looked at me and he said, Patty, one thing you need to learn in life is money is not everything. I spent my whole life working hard to become a four-star general. I have a house here in Colorado Springs, I have a house in the mountains. But I made some big sacrifices along the way. And I didn't get to go see my daughter's ballet recitals or my son's Cub Scout events. And for those things, I regret it. He said, money doesn't matter now because I want to spend time with my family. I've worked hard. I want to enjoy my family and enjoy all the hard work that I've had in my life. The one thing that I've heard over and over from senior leaders is they regret not spending enough time with their families. And so I have always kept that in the back of my mind and made sure that no matter what I did, that I was focused first and foremost on my because at the end of the day, when I retire, that's all that's going to be left is my family. From uh, Wright-Patterson, I actually moved close to here. I moved to Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama. My first assignment in the South, uh, never lived uh, in Alabama before, so never experienced the heat and humidity uh, that we had there. Uh, but I did something really interesting. I taught at a leadership school. There's a school there called Squadron Officer School, and they teach Air Force captains communication, presentation, problem solving, team building, and leadership. That was a really great assignment for me because uh, I got to get up and teach, uh, but I also got to see leadership in action. And I walked away from that uh, experience thinking, you know, there's two kinds of leaders. There are those leaders who are born to lead, and then there are those who try and work really hard to become great leaders. And as I watched my students and I evaluated them, it was very easy to see those natural born leaders because their peers just gravitated towards them. 
It was an amazing experience, but once the time came for me to move on, I decided that the next thing I needed to do was to go to the Pentagon, because remember, I was going to retire in the military. So I used my network in the military. I got a job at the Pentagon in the air staff. The general officer there hired me. The colonel I worked for had released me. Everything was all set. I was going to move to Washington, D.C. And then I learned the biggest lesson of my life. And that is, I had a plan. But my plan isn't the right plan. God's plan is what's right. And I didn't know what God's plan was. Um, but when my assignment to the Pentagon was canceled, because there was someone at Maxwell that had to move, they were coming out of Air Command and Staff College, I got really upset, really upset, really emotional, because I realized I had no control over my career, I had no control over my life, and the military could pretty much do whatever they wanted to me, and um, and I would just have to, to abide by it. So when my assignments canceled, I didn't know what I was going to do. I picked up the phone, I called my dad, and I said, this has happened. I'm not going to the Pentagon anymore. My parents were in Washington, D.C., so I was excited for my kids to be near my parents. And my dad and I talked for a long time about his transition out of the military. And one of the things that I saw was how difficult it was for him as a full colonel to leave the military and start a new career at the same level that he ended. Because what happens is corporate America likes to take a senior officer and put them in middle management because of stereotypes or because they're just not sure what to do with someone who has you know, been a leader in the military. And for that reason, um, military recruiting has always been a topic very near and dear to my heart. In that conversation with my dad, we both talked about, well, maybe I should take this as a sign and go look at other opportunities. I knew nothing about corporate America. Remember, my dad was in the military. My mom was a nurse. But I, on a whim, called up a search firm that places junior military officers called the Lucas Group. And I said, ah, oh, Patty walks in. You know, I'm thinking about getting out of the military. I'm not really sure if I'm marketable or not, but, you know, I thought, you know, maybe I could just come and meet with you and see kind of what the opportunities are. So I, I had that conversation. And the way Lucas Group works is they bring all these employers to a location and you interview with eight to ten employers in the same day, one right after the other. So I went to this, I met with companies like GE, Price Waterhouse, Ford Company, Nations Bank, uh, and after that day I was asked to come back for second interviews with every single company that I interviewed with. I was shocked because I had no idea that my project management skills would apply towards corporate America. Ultimately, I decided to go to Nations Bank, which um, two months after signing with Nations Bank became Bank of America, with Bank of America and Nations Bank combined. My first um, position with the bank, I was supposed to be in Atlanta, Georgia, actually Alpharetta, Georgia. But after they announced the merger, they called me and they said, you know, I know we said you were going to go to Alpharetta, Georgia, but what about going to Stanford, Connecticut? <laughs> and so I said, okay, uh, never lived in the Northeast before, but I'll go ahead and give it a try. Packed my family up, moved to Connecticut, and hated it. Absolutely hated it. I decided then that I'm definitely not a Northeastern person. And the reason I hated it was because I was in a small part of Nations Bank called Nations Credit Commercial. It's a group that had spun off from a company named GE Capital. And um, the culture there was really not the culture that I was looking for. 
In fact, it's one of the biggest lessons I learned coming out of the military is you've got to look at the culture of an organization because you and your values have to fit into the culture of the organization that you're going to. Now, fortunately, the project that I was assigned to when I went to Nations Credit was called Y2K. Uh, and so we literally sat around waiting for the end of the world and preparing from a technology point of view for that to happen. Of course, nothing happened. But it did give me the opportunity to work with the big bank. And at Nations Credit, which is no longer part of Bank of America, it was a big bad bank because they didn't like the big, big company. I realized quickly, culturally, that that is what I fit in with that the bank culture was my culture and my core values were the bank's core values. So after a year of being in Sanford, Connecticut, I got online and I started looking at jobs. And the one that I found was in technology. You know, I was a computer science minor, I was a back major. <laughs> I was managing a technology team in Dallas, Texas. My husband, who was an Air Force pilot, was about to get out of the military, and for those of you that don't know, Dallas is the headquarters to Southwest Airlines, American Airlines, and even at that time, Delta had a pilot base there. So we decided that'd probably be a pretty good place for our family. I'd never lived in Texas before, but again, packed everybody up. This time we had two kids, and we moved to Dallas, Texas. My first job, I was a technology manager managing a team of seven developers. After about four months, these developers, um, who it was kind of chaos when I got there, I was brought in to fix the relationships with the business and improve the development process. Uh, after about four months, I was bored out of my mind. We fixed all the problems, everything was running smoothly. And because of the work ethic that I brought from the military, I went to my boss and I said, you're paying me a good salary and I'm kind of bored, um, so I'd like to do more. And they ended up giving me a few more developers. Ironically, a couple of years into that job, some of the developers told me they weren't really impressed with my resume. That they didn't, because I had never been a developer, they thought, what in the world is this woman gonna do? Um, two years into it, they said, we realize what you do, you know how to lead people. And that's what we needed. We needed someone who looked to lead us. We knew how to do all the technical development, we didn't need that from you. But they didn't appreciate that until we had had the chance to work together for a while. When I was at Bank of America, I started with a team of seven. Um, I managed probably every technology system you can imagine in the bank. I ran the wire system, ACH, electronic payments. I ran credit card, I ran merchant, commercial card, I ran transaction services, all in the technology side. So cash vaults, ATMs, check processing, um, had pretty much done everything that you could think of other than I hadn't been in the trading side, I hadn't been in wealth management. And it was, I guess I was in, at the point in my career where you didn't choose the job, they came and found you. And they came to me and they asked me to take a job that I really wasn't interested in. It was running business continuity and crisis management for all of Bank of America. And at this time, uh, Bank of America had just acquired Countrywide and had just acquired Merrill Lynch. So we really became a global company. Uh, when they came and asked me to take the position, my boss at the time said to me, this position will make you a better leader in the long term. And I trusted in him. And I have to tell you, he was right. Because uh, to this day, while I had already managed everything that you can imagine from a technology and a systems point of view at the bank, uh, I got to see a different perspective. I got to see how the business were in and had responsibility for making sure that in the event of a crisis, whether it was a pandemic, 
whether it was a natural disaster, that Bank of America had the appropriate plans in place, that they were tested, and that should something happen, we knew what to do, we knew how to do it, and it wouldn't impact our customers. Probably one of the best jobs I've ever had, although I would not have chosen it. You know, I mentioned that I had uh, managed almost every application that you can think of in the bank, and I was getting kind of bored. I used to say, you know, I could probably manage this area with my eyes closed. I didn't feel like I was making a huge difference. And so I started thinking about, well, maybe it's time for me to do something different. Maybe it's time for me to find a new experience and get uncomfortable, because I've learned when I'm uncomfortable, it means I'm learning and I'm growing. And I really like to learn and grow, even today. Um, I think that it's something that we all have to focus on from the time you know, you're a young child until the time that we go to be with God. But you should constantly learn and grow. So I started talking with different people about what I wanted to do, and I, I will tell you a few years earlier, I had thought, you know, someday I really would like to be a global CIO. I love managing teams that are global. I love learning new cultures. I love traveling. Um, I'm going to start looking for a global CIO position. So I started talking to several search firms. Um, you know, they, of course, wanted me to stay in financial services, which I really didn't want to do. I felt like I had been at Bank of America, which was so wonderful, that, you know, going to another big bank would be, would be a letdown. Uh, the search firms tried to keep me in financial services, but fortunately, I ended up interviewing with two companies, very different, Kimberly Clark, uh, which is consumer product goods, and then the Briggs Company, which is Armored Car. Um, I ultimately chose to go with the Brinks company, one, because the customers were financial services. So we did business with Bank of America, J.P. Morgan Chase, KeyBank, you name it, Brinks probably did business with them, and they were a global company. They were also in the middle of a major transformation where technology had been run in the country level, and there were 40 countries that we had technology teams. And they were hiring a CIO to come in and transform the technology organization, centralize the technology organization, and really help uh, grow revenue and reduce costs. So I spent uh, several years, almost three, at Brinks. I actually did ride around in a Brinks truck, which was interesting. Um, it's a tough job, and I have a great appreciation for the people that are on the trucks because their lives are in danger. In fact, uh, just last year, Rick had one of our um, crew members shot and killed uh, when uh, in the middle of the heist. Um, so it's a dangerous business. They didn't want me to go out on the truck, but I said, no, I'm going. Um, and so, I got to see what it was like being them and seeing how technology was enabling them or maybe not enabling them. And what we needed to do in technology to help keep them safe and what we needed to do in technology to help our customer experience be improved. And that's really been a focus for me as a leader in technology is making sure that our customers and our users, so whether they're internal business partners or external um, customers, have the best experience possible leveraging our technology. So July of last year, uh, we were actually on a, an amazing trip, two weeks in Asia, went to Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Japan in two weeks. And I got this phone call about this company, Tesis, which, you know, I had worked with Tesis when I was at Bank of America. In fact, Brinks actually worked with Tesis, our net spend division, the prepaid card group. 
And um, I said, I can't talk to you right now. I've got I've got to go on this trip. I'll be back you know, in July. Maybe we can talk then. Um, got back from my trip. Went home, said to my husband, uh, hey, I got this call about this job in Columbus, Georgia. He looked at me and he said, we're not moving to Columbus, Georgia. <laughs> I went to Fort Benning when he was at the Air Force Academy. He said, I went to jump school at Fort Benning. Uh, so all he got to see at Fort Benning was Victory Drive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, hence the, uh, the reason he said, heck no, we're not moving to one this Georgia. But I said, you know, I really like Tesis. I've worked with them before. I'm going to go talk to them. And my husband was very supportive of that. But, you know, at the end of the day, we're like, we're not moving to Columbus, Georgia. We've been in Texas for 16 years, in Dallas, and we loved it. And um, so I came out, I met with people, and I really liked them. So then I went on a mission to try and find a reason to not leave Dallas, Texas. My three little kids had never moved before. They were born in Dallas, lived in the same house, so they knew nothing but Dallas, Texas. It came out a second time. Gosh, I really like this company. I talked to everybody. Tell me about this Tesis company. And all I heard was great things about from the customers. The customers love Tesis. The employees love their company. And the culture, for me, was a perfect fit. My core values are their core values. Their culture is my culture. Now I have to tell you, it was a little bit intimidating to know that I was gonna come in and replace someone who'd been with the company 40 something years. Who you all have heard from, Kim Tai. He's like a living legend in Tesis. That was a little scary. But ultimately I had my husband come out and I said, what do you think? Because I would never make a decision without my partner, my husband, being supportive of that. So we thought about it for a long time, we prayed about it. And one of the things that really drew us here was the commitment to the community. I'm going to talk a little bit about commitment to community and making a difference in just a second. But that is really what drew us here to Columbus, Georgia. Now, TSIS is an amazing company, and I am so blessed to be part of such an amazing group of people, such a successful company. And I'm able to help them transform the technology organization. You probably have heard that TSIS has focused a lot on mainframe technology. That's kind of the core of TSIS today, and it will always be a core of TSIS. But now we're focused on bringing in newer technologies as well and moving some things off the mainframe into distributed environments. We're looking at kind of new buzzword concepts in technology, APIs, RESTful APIs, moving things into a cloud environment. Have you heard anybody talk about a data lake or a reservoir? Those are all things that we are doing right now. In fact, we have proof of concepts with several of our customers um, right now where we are basically leveraging RESTful APIs for the first time uh, in, in the issuing business within TSIS. So one of the things that we've done is we've taken resources from around the globe in TSIS and we've pull them together to interface uh, and help us make architecture decisions. So one of the first changes that I made when I came to TSIS is I took a gentleman from Dubai, originally from Iran, lives in Dubai, and made him our head of architecture. His name is Bashar. And he's leading some of these transformational modernization projects. So while you've heard that TSIS is a mainframe organization, and we are, and we will be. We are also doing new technology, and we're looking for good people who are interested in Java, .NET, data analytics. We need 
good people coming from this school in particular to help us achieve our objectives going forward. We have four objectives. One, growing revenue. We're doing that through systems re-architecture, systems modernization. We're driving efficiencies, which is our second objective. So how do we do things faster? Automating more, less manual. We're focused on risk, because that is one of the things that TESIS is well known for. And then finally, and most importantly, we're focused on our people. <coughs> our talent, developing our talent. One of the things I'm working on right now is an internship program where hopefully we'll have students from here come spend the summer with us between your junior and senior year and then we can bring you in from an entry level uh, to help us drive some of these transformational projects that we have. So a lot is happening at TSIS, but I have to tell you something else. One of the things I learned at Brinks was that in a development program that I should consider uh, becoming part of a board of directors. And that, as I mentioned earlier, I like to learn and grow. And so I actually had an opportunity earlier this year to interview uh, to become a director of Texas Capital Bank, which is a wholesale bank based out of Dallas, Texas. Uh, and I actually just went to my first board meeting last week. So as I mentioned, continuing to learn and grow. I am continuing to learn and grow. I learned so much uh, just in the first meeting, and I'm really excited about how I'm going to be able to help Texas Capital uh, and TSIS, because I think it'll help me be a better CIO of TSIS, what I'm going to learn from the board. So. I've talked a lot about my career, but I want to talk about something else that's very passionate, I'm very passionate about, and that is that when you have success in your life, I believe you have a responsibility to make a difference. And for me, um, I had a huge life event in 2001, and that is when my middle son, Nathan, was born. Nathan uh, had Down syndrome. And I didn't know anything about Down syndrome. <laughs> My husband didn't know anything about Down syndrome. We've never had anybody in our family that had special needs. But when he was born, my husband and I learned that God, not only does he have a plan for all of us, but he's got a purpose. And I think one of the biggest lessons learned is that understanding that God's plan is what you should do, and learning what your purpose is in this world is what helps drive success. So from the day he was born, I like to tell people, I know I became a better human being, uh, because I started to search for how I could make a difference in this world. And that is, for me, that's my purpose. As I mentioned earlier, that's one of the things that drew me here to Columbus, Georgia. When Nathan was little, we decided that full inclusion was what we wanted for him in school. It had never been done in our school district. But we decided that's what our other kids had, so it was going to happen for Nathan. So in his kindergarten year, he was fully included, and then about six months into it, the school said, no, we want him in a special class away from the typical kids. So we said, no, that is not what we're going to do. We hired an attorney, we filed something called due process, and we won. Nathan stayed fully included in school, in his classroom. He was the first child with Down syndrome that was fully included. And the best part of the story is we had a great relationship with the school district, and uh, we changed the outcome for not just Nathan, but we changed the outcome for all the kids that came behind him. Because that special classroom that we wanted to put him in, it doesn't exist anymore in his school district. It was that time when I joined the Texas Governor's Committee uh, for People with Disabilities. I focused on inclusion and education and meaningful employment. Uh, that was what was important to me. 
And at Bank of America, I had the opportunity to do something that I'm very proud of, and that is there's an organization called Support Services that was primarily in the Northeast, uh, where people with intellectual disabilities have full-time jobs with benefits, they're Bank of America employees. And I was convinced that I was going to make that happen in Dallas, Texas. I was going to find a way to create jobs at Bank of America. And so I spent 18 months <coughs> talking to every executive at Bank of America and finally found some great roles in the mortgage organization. Today there are 80 individuals with intellectual disabilities, whether it's autism, whether it's Down syndrome or something else, that have full-time employment because I knew that that was something that God had planned for me to do. My husband and I have raised over $500,000 for Down syndrome cognitive research. Uh, today, there's a clinical trial at UT Southwestern where mothers of expectant uh, that are expecting a child with Down syndrome are in a clinical trial taking Prozac. Uh, what we found in our clinical trials is that we can change the outcome for those children simply by giving them a drug that many people take safely today. And there's also a very promising clinical trial with Roche Pharmaceuticals uh, that improves cognition and functioning for individuals with Down syndrome. And that is in progress as well, coming out of the research that my husband and I have spent a lot of time and energy fundraising for. So I don't know what God's plan for me is next. I certainly did not plan on standing here in front of you being in Columbus, Georgia. But I'm very happy that I'm here. I'm going to continue to figure out how I can make a difference at TSIS and here in Columbus and here at Columbus State University because that's what I am supposed to do. I'd like to close with some of the key learnings that I have figured out over my 50 years of being on this world, and that is first and foremost that God has a plan and purpose for all of us. Find it and live it. Uh, with hard work, dedication, and commitment, anything can be accomplished. And I am proof of that. When you're uncomfortable in a new role or a challenge is in front of you, use it as an opportunity to grow and learn from it. Don't be afraid. Identify your passion. Once you find something you're passionate about, that is where you will find success. Always do the right thing. I always say, if you do the right thing and something happens, at least you can live with yourself because you've done the right thing. And finally, remember that family and faith should always come before work. Because when your career is said and done, that is all we have left.